So the story that I want to share with you this evening that I want to start off with is one of the final episodes in the life of Musa alayhi salam. And this is towards the end of his career. I've done two story nights involving Musa alayhi salam so far here. The first one was his young years, up until the point when he got married. So we did that some time ago. The second episode was when he was up on the mountain and he spoke with Allah. That was the second episode, okay? Now we're on episode three. But before we get into episode three, you need a little bit of background, just a little bit of recap, because some of you haven't seen season one and season two, right? So before you start season three, Bismillah, you need a little bit of previously on Musa. So I've got to gotta give you a little background so that we can catch up a little quickly. Musa alayhi salam, when he was a child, uh, he lived in, in Egypt, and the king at the time, the pharaoh, saw a dream that a creature of black and white is going to ruin his kingdom. So he ordered all of the wolves to go kill every panda they could find, and one panda was taken by his mother and thrown into a river in order to escape the, the evil dream of the, the king who had nightmares. And then eventually he ended up at a Chinese restaurant <laughs> where he learned to make noodles. But his destiny was to learn Kung Fu and come back and challenge the evil king. Uh, the reason I say that to you is because Musa salam, was in Egypt and the Pharaoh saw a dream that a, that a baby among the Israelites is going to destroy his kingdom. So he ordered all the babies killed. And so when the order, all the babies were supposed to be killed, what did his mother do? We did this in episode one. Put him in the river. That's actually Kung Fu Panda. Right? And he put him in the river, and he goes, and he, uh, she, he ends up back in the palace, is raised there, and eventually accidentally kills someone. We talked about that before too, in a previous episode. Runs away from Egypt, ends up getting married. We talked about that adventure. And now it's been about 10 years that he's married and Allah calls him to the mountain. And there's a conversation that happens with Allah on the mountain. That conversation is two different parts. One part of that conversation we've already talked about. Another part of this conversation is where we're going to start today. Some things Allah did not tell us in the last episode in Surah Taha. He's going to tell us in this episode in Surah Ash-Shu'ara. So today... What I'm going to talk about is the way Allah tells this story in surah number 26. That's all we're going to do. The ayah by ayah, we're going to go through how Allah tells the story Himself. What surah did I just say? Shu'ara. Surah number 26. Okay, one thing I need you to remember before we start. Well, just one thing about this story. And that is, as Musa was running away from Egypt, save, trying to save his life, he prayed to Allah. As he was running into the desert, he prayed to Allah. And he said, Rabbi Najini min al zalimin. Mom, take a chair. Mom. Mom, mom. That's my mom, everyone. Round of applause for my mom. Okay. I love embarrassing her. Okay. And th that's my dad, okay? Okay. Anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. so, so he's, as he's escaping Egypt, uh, he said, and you need, I need you to remember this prayer. He said, Rabbi Najini min al qawmi zalimin, Master, rescue me from the wrongdoing people. I don't need you to know the Arabic. Rescue me from the who? Wrongdoing people. And when he makes this dua, he's out of Egypt. He ends up in Madiya and lives ten, gets married. He's no longer being hunted by the most mighty empire on earth. The, the biggest police, the biggest military state on the planet is looking to find and kill one man and they can't find him. He's hiding out in this small town of Madian For 10 years he's safe. In other words, for 10 years, Allah answered his prayer. What was his prayer? Rescue me from who? The wrongdoing people. And he was rescued. Sometimes you find yourself or I find myself in a situation where there, there's, it seems like there's no escape. And there are people around that are a source of great trouble, abuse, some kind, you feel some kind of a, like you're in some kind of a hostage situation, and all you can do is, Ya Allah, rescue me from these wrongdoing people. You can't make dua, Ya Allah, just one bus, one bus accident, please. Just one time, if they can just fall down the stairs, that would be really great. No, you can't make those kinds of duas. You don't make dua to hurt someone else, but you can ask Allah to rescue you, to protect you. And that's what he did. He asked a letter because he had no way of escaping. So he says, Rabbi Najini min al-Qawmi 
and he escapes. And Allah answered his dua. This is where I want to start. He's up on the mountain. His family's down waiting for him. It's nighttime. And Allah says, وَإِذْ نَادَى رَبُّكَ مُوسَى When your master called on to Musa, أَنِئْتِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Go back to the wrongdoing people. Why is that important? What was his dua again? Rescue me from who? The wrongdoing people. And he's been thanking Allah every day. Ya Allah, I, I thank you so much. You rescued me from the wrongdoing people. You rescued me from the wrongdoing people. And he finally gets to have a conversation with Allah. And Allah tells him, Yeah, I need you to what? Go back to the wrongdoing people. But, and this is part of Allah's plan. And there, there's a lesson in that for you and me too. Because part of, part of the reason I want to share this story with you, and it's so important, is because the story of Musa alayhi salam was told to the Prophet because the story of Musa alayhi salam is actually very much like the story of the Prophet himself. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allah rescued him from the wrongdoing people. Yes or no? And he rescued him and he sent him to Medina. But when he went to Medina, he showed him a dream that he has to come back to what? To Mecca, come back to the wrongdoing people. Musa alayhi salam was given this instruction, you need to go back to the wrongdoing people. Sometimes Allah helps you escape wrongdoing people. He gets you away. And when you go away, maybe you meet two righteous individuals, like Timon and Pumbaa, who, leave, who live a worry-free philosophy. Right? What is it called? What's it called? Thank you, Akuna Matara. Mashallah, the Islamic knowledge is impressive in the audience. Akuna Matara, which is clearly a wonderful phrase. It means no worries for the rest of your days. Right? And you need that time. You need a few years to get bigger and stronger. Until finally, when... Well, by the way, which lion am I talking about that gets bigger and stronger? What's his name? Simba. See that? This is why, mashallah, this is a religious community. I know you guys. Simba, rahimahullah, meets Timon and Pumbaa, radiallahu anhumah. And then he, he made hijrah to them. And then they, you know, they spend their 10 years together. And eventually, you know when that, what happens in the Lion King? When he's old enough, one day there's a monkey. Anybody know the monkey's name? I want to know. How's, mashallah. Islamic history in this room is impressive. Rafiki hits him on the head in the original with a staff. This is important. Hits him with what? A staff. A staff. And he says, I know your father. And then he shows him a vision a heavenly vision of his father Mufasa and he tells, Mufasa tells Simba to do what? Go back. Go back, Go back to the wrongdoing person, isn't it? Yeah. Actually, that part of the story, him escaping into the desert, him becoming stronger and eventually seeing a heavenly vision and the heavenly vision tells him, go back to the wrongdoing people again, is stolen directly from who? From Musa alayhi salam. That's actually, so the next time you're watching a Disney film and your parents say, what are you doing? You say, I'm studying tafsir. That's what you're doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, the point is that, that sometimes Allah gets you away from wrongdoing people long enough that you heal, that you become stronger. But maybe the point was that you go back and you have to face those wrongdoing people eventually. Because if you don't face them, they will have other people that need to run away from them. And maybe some of their victims need to become their biggest problem. They need to be the ones to challenge them. Maybe that's, the, that's what the plan is with Allah all along. So Allah tells him to run away from the, or escapes him from the wrongdoing people. Ten years later, he's up on the mountain. Allah says, أَنِئْتِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Go back to the wrongdoing people. قَوْمَ فِرْعَوْنَ أَلَا يَتَّقُونَ The people, the nation of the Pharaoh. The nation of the Pharaoh. By the way, if your babies are crying, it's totally fine. But if they're crying for three minutes or longer, then take a quick walk and come back. Because, I mean, I, I actually like the sound of babies. I'd rather hold the baby myself. If you don't hear about. But I don't mean to offend, but... But yeah, so, you know, some babies... By the way, every time I tell the story of Musa Ali Salam, there's a crying baby. Which I think is for dramatic effect. Oh, <laughs> Musa... Anyway... Um, it's this true story. I was preaching this a long time ago. One of the, one of the episodes in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And there was a huge crowd, 1,800 people. And all the way in the back, there was a kid that Allah had given this special set of lungs. He was loud. I had a mic on. This is in a convention center. And he was louder than me. He was impressive. So I had to stop my story and go find him because I needed to appreciate this like soprano voice. 
And I kid you not, I asked, hey, what's his name? They said Musa. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> figures, figures. <laughs> but anyway, go back to the wrongdoing people. And Allah, you know, Musa alayhi salam is thinking, hopefully it's some other wrongdoing people. It can't be the Pharaoh because Allah, I already made dua to Allah to get, get me away from them. So, I mean, hopefully there's some other wrongdoing people around. Allah clarifies in the next ayah and says, قَوْمَ فِرْعَوْنَ أَلَا يَتَّقُونَ No, I mean the nation of the Pharaoh. They sh- sh- shouldn't they be the ones to protect themselves? And this is a phrase that requires some attention. Allah tells Musa, the people of the Pharaoh should be worried and try to protect themselves. How many, army, how many people are in the army of Musa a.s.? One person, fugitive from the law, wanted for murder, unarmed, unarmed. And what does the Pharaoh have? The largest army on earth. The mightiest superpower on the planet at the time. The most advanced architecture on the planet at the time. The most intimidating you know, naval forces, land forces. Other nations used to be scared of the Pharaohs. And other princes and kings used to leave their kingdom to come to the Pharaoh's palace to study under the pharaohs so they can improve their kingdoms. They were like the international university too. That's what the pharaohs were. And everybody was scared of them. As a matter of fact, in the Quran, Allah describes when they used to talk about themselves, the pharaohs, they used to say, other people give our example. We're number one. Your lifestyle, that is the, biggest, the best example for everyone else. They were so powerful, and they left such a mark on the earth, that today... In 2020, when you open up a dollar bill, what's on there? There's a pyramid on there. Because the modern great nations of the world emulate. They want to be like the pharaohs. They want to be like them. They, they, they envy what they accomplished back then. That's how powerful they were. If you've ever been to Turkey, uh, the, the, the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, right by the Blue Mosque, there's a, something called an obelisk. And now it's okay if you don't know what an obelisk is. Just say astaghfirullah. Obelisk is, you know the Washington Monument? You know how it's shaped like a tower and like a triangle on top, a pyramid on top? Guess what that is? That's Egyptian architecture. And the Egyptian kings used to make that. And the Washington Monument is actually designed after the Egyptian obelisk. And an actual Egyptian obelisk, they usually have hieroglyphics on there. You know what I'm saying? Like those things, right? They have those markings on there of birds and people and all that stuff. That was their writing, that was their script. There's an original Egyptian, ancient Egyptian obelisk in Istanbul, in Europe, in Istanbul, right by the Blue Mosque. What's it doing there? That's supposed to be in what country? It's supposed to be in Egypt. Why is it there? Because when after the Egyptian empire fell, the next world superpower was the Roman empire. And the Roman empire, when they took over Egypt eventually, they wanted to show the world that they are the new Egypt. So they took some of those towers, put them on ships, you know, traveled with them across the oceans, and put them in different parts of the Roman Empire to show the world that we are the new Egypt. That's how impressive Egypt was to them. If you go to, uh, you know, if, if you look at architecture like uh, governor's mansions or Supreme Court buildings and, you know, uh, government offices, you'll notice you have long steps, like really wide steps. And at the end of that, st- those steps, there are columns, right? And those columns are usually o- like circular. And sometimes they're skinnier on the bottom and then they get thicker and then skinnier on top. You'll notice that. That's actually Egyptian ancient architecture. And European architecture for government offices and government buildings wanted to copy Egyptian architecture again to say, we want to be like them. That's how powerful they were. Thousands of years after that civilization died, they're still impressive to the world governments today. That's how powerful they were. And Allah is telling Musa salam, who was one man, and the order was, among the, the, the authorities, the order was, as soon as you find him, kill him. As soon as you find him, kill him. And Allah tells Musa, yeah, no problem, go back to the wrongdoing nation. They should be the ones that should seek protection. What? They should be the ones to seek protection? That kind of sounds a little... And Musa is the one who ran for his life, remember? And it's like Allah is saying, no, 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 you don't need security, they need security. And that's what Allah tells him on top of that mountain. Why? Because Allah is letting him know that when Allah is behind you, it doesn't matter how powerful a bully is. 
you know, there are sometimes there are people in your life that are pretty powerful, that have the power or the threat to hurt you in some way. Maybe they're physically more powerful than you are. Maybe they're financially more powerful than you are. Maybe they're socially more powerful than you are. Maybe their voice is louder than your voice is. Maybe there are people you can't escape from. Maybe you're making the same kind of dua like Musa. Ya Allah, rescue me from these wrongdoing people. Get me away from them. And maybe you can't still can't find an escape. But Allah is telling us that people that do wrong, you're not the one that needs to be scared. Who needs to be scared? They are. Now, this is where the story gets really interesting. Because now Musa is going to respond. Musa is one of five messengers in the Qur'an that had the greatest commitment to Allah. Okay, they're called Ulul Azmi Minar Rusul. You don't have to know the Arabic, but they're five messengers that had one of, some of the greatest commitment to Allah ever. And Musa is talked about more than any other prophet. So he's like the super role model in the Quran for the Prophet. Okay. One thing you know about prophets is when Allah tells them to do something, they what? They do it. They do it. And mashallah, since your knowledge of Disney is so impressive, let me ask you another, you know, a side question. In Arabic, we say, Sami'na wa. Wow. Wow. Lots of Arabic in the house. We hear and we what? We hear and we obey. And the biggest example of we hear and we obey is obviously prophets, right? As soon as prophets hear Allah tell them something, they what? They do it. Ibrahim alayhi salam is told, go jump in a fire. He doesn't turn to Allah and say, it's kind of hot. He, he, he jumps in. Or he's told to slaughter his son. He says, Ya Allah is a baby. Can I take a lamb instead? A goat maybe? Now how about some, cut some carrots instead? No. He says, Allah told me to do it. I'm going to do it. That's it. You know, when prophets are told to do something, they what? Do it. So Allah just told Musa to do something. Yes or no? Yes. What did he tell him to do? Go back. So I expect, because he's a prophet, and Allah is talking to him, and Allah isn't even talking to him indirectly, Allah is speaking to him completely directly, right in front of him. He's speaking, he can hear Allah himself. You know, behind the veil, he can hear Allah himself speak to him directly, and Allah is telling him, go back to the wrongdoing people. At this point, I would think, Musa is going to say, I hear and I what? Right away, my master. I'm going to go. Here's what Musa says. He doesn't say one thing. He says five things. He says five things. And before we're done, maybe even before this first break, I'm going to make sure you know those five things by heart. You're all going to know them. And you're not going to take any notes. And when I say don't take any notes, I'm only talking to the women. Because men don't take notes. We don't have that problem. We don't, we, we're genetically incapable of that issue. The, I mean, telling men to take notes is the same as telling them to go into a coma. If you see some of my students' notes, if you ever see like, you know those patients that have like a machine stuck to them and the heart rate monitor? That's what their notes look like. <laughs> and so, some of the students, the full-time students I had, some of them that, that, that were women, they, their notes, they write everything down. They write every, I sneeze, they write down Alhamdulillah. Like they write everything down. <laughs> Like, why are you writing everything down? <laughs> Don't, calm down. <laughs> but anyhow, so you're not taking any notes, but I, I will expect you to remember them, and I'll make sure that you do. Let's see. If, how many things did he say again? Okay, and what did Allah tell him to do? Go back. Look, the thing is, when Allah tells you to do something, I only expect to hear one thing. Yes. That's all I expect to hear. But he's going to tell him five things. Number one, he says, Rabbi inni akhafu an yukadhibun. Master, I'm really scared that they're going to call me a liar. I'm scared that they're going to call me a liar. Wait, you're talking to Allah right now. You should be scared of who? Allah. And you're going to talk to Allah and tell him you're scared of people calling you a liar? There are some people in the ummah Allah bless them, they are more Islamic than Islam. So you'll hear them say things like, when you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should fear nothing else. <laughs> um, wait, hold on a second. Because I'm pretty sure Musa fears Allah, yes or no? And he's talking to Allah directly, and he still says, I'm scared. And he doesn't say, Ya Allah, I only fear you. What is he afraid? What, is, what was number one again? They're going to call him a liar. That's number one. That's pretty important. 
On a side note, it reminds me of something crazy. Today I'm going to tell you some crazy stories. I don't care if you don't laugh or cry. It doesn't matter to me. I need to get some things out of my system. So a long time ago, I, when I was first coming into Islam, one of the things I heard was that the iman of the Muslim, our faith is weak if we don't truly fear Allah. And if in order to fear Allah, we have to remember death. Right? In order to feel Allah, oh, we have to remember death. And I was like 19 years old at the time. And I was like, I need to remember death. I need to figure out some way of remembering death. So I went to an Islamic bookstore. I went to an Islamic bookstore. And I'm looking for like some Islamic video about what? Death. Like, I'm going to watch this and be so Islamic. My iman's going to be like, ah. Oh. So I'm looking, looking, looking. And you know how they have those like... They have these DVDs. Back then, was, this, I'm so old, this is before like, you could just YouTube something. So you go to the bookstore and you're looking for a DVD. And there's one DVD, it said, Remembrance of Death. And I pull it out, and it had a skull on it. And it had like a bloody font that said, Remember Death. And I was like, this is what I need. <laughs> this is it, I found it. So I got that DVD, I brought it home, I put it in, I was like, this is going to be awesome. I'm ready, to, I'm, gonna, I'm ready to believe so hard right now. I turn it on and there's a sheikh and he looks really like serious and he's got this like beard, like a serious like Islamic beard and he's got a turban and everything and I was like, yes, yes and then he starts speaking in Arabic and I didn't know Arabic at the time but Arabic sounds serious and you know sometimes khatibs you know people that give khutbah and stuff they, when they're talking to you they talk super normal like, salamu alaikum, how are you, how's everything and then they put the mic on and they start giving the khutbah and they turn into somebody else they're like, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmadu, wa nasta'inu. Well, I was like, you're such a nice guy, what happened to you? And then when the khutbah is done, they're like, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? I shall I'm like, <laughs> but anyway, so he, when he did the Arabic, it was really intense. And I was like, yes, yes. And now it's going to be the, the English part, right? Because then he's going to tell us about death. And he, I didn't know that this video was recorded in Scotland. And he was Scottish. And he had a completely Scottish accent. And I don't know if you've ever heard a Scottish accent or not, but he said, imagine yourself on your last day. What would you do? Where would you go? Who would you speak to? You're all gonna die. <laughs> so my iman did not go up at all. <laughs> but all I did that week to my, my, my friends in college, they're like, hey, what you doing? I was like, you're all gonna die. <laughs> like that's what I said. <laughs> anyway, I forgot. What was the first thing Musa told Allah? Call, call it out. They're gonna call me a liar. That's number one. Number two, sadri. He says, my chest will get tight. My chest will get tight. Okay, how many things we got now? What was number one? I'm scared. They'll call me a... You know, I was in Toronto sharing this story. I said, what was number one? And 2,000 people said, liar! <laughs> and I said, no, that makes me feel bad. Because it makes me feel like you're calling me a liar. How about you say, they will call me a liar? I kid you not, they were so passionate. Like, I was like, what was number one? They're like, liar! I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so they're going to call me a liar. And what's going to happen next? Number two? My chest is going to get tight. Okay. And my chest is going to become tight and my tongue will stop moving. My tongue will stop moving. That's three now. They're going to call me a liar. I forgot the second one. My chest will get tight and then... My tongue will stop moving. Let me tell you, these three are connected to each other. When they call me a liar, it's going to make me feel bad. It's going to make me feel anxious. It's going to make me feel frustrated. How can you call me a liar? I'm not, I'm not lying. And when they all gang up on me like that and bully me like that, I'm going to start having a, maybe a panic attack. And when a person has a panic attack, they have a hard time breathing. And when they have a hard time breathing, it's described as your chest becoming what? tight like I, I, I can't no I'm not I'm not lying I'm not, what, why are you saying that like that's how what's going to happen to him and when that happens to a person when they have a panic attack and they're being insulted and attacked then they're not able to think clearly or say what they were originally going to say so they forget what they were going to say and he says my tongue will stop what moving 
I mean, you want me to go back and talk to them, but they're going to call me a liar. That's going to give me a panic attack. My chest will become tight. And when I get a panic attack, I won't be able to say anything. I can't speak when I get a panic attack. And I'll come back to that in a second and talk about how that applies to us. But we've got three things so far. How many things we're supposed to get? Five. Five. So let's go to number four. Number four. He says, Ya Allah, thank you for the opportunity. But uh, since I can't speak that well, I know someone who's like really good at speaking. My brother, he's like awesome. So فَأَرْسِلْ إِلَى Harun, Could you give this mission to Harun instead? Just, <laughs> I can't do it. Give it to who? Harun. Give it to Harun. Send, send this job to Harun. And in other places in the Quran, he even explains to Allah why. هُوَ أَفْسَحُ مِنِّي لِسَانًا He's a better speaker than I am. He could do it. I can't do it, Ya Allah. I told you just why I can't do it. You know? This is why I can't obey you. Because I have a problem. I get scared because of their insults. And then I'm, I'm going to get panic attacks. My chest will become tight. And then my, I won't be able to speak. And because I can't speak, I'm no good for this job. Someone I know is much better. Who is who? Harun. That's number four. Give it to Harun. This is called Al-Fa' as Therefore send it to Harun. Therefore give it to Harun. And then he asks, he adds last one. Number five, yeah? But before I tell you number five, impress me. What's number one? They'll call me a liar. What's number two? My chest will get tight. Number three? My tongue will stop moving. Number four? Give it to Harun. Here's number five. He says, وَلَهُمْ عَلَيَّ ذَنْبٌ فَأَخَافُ وَيَقْتُلُونَ They have a crime recorded against me. They have a crime recorded against me. And I'm, therefore, I'm scared that they're going to kill me. I'm terrified that they will kill me. We'll make it summarized, they will kill me, is number five. So five things, yeah? Okay, this is not, I'm not going to ask you for all five now. I'll just ask you what number one was. I'm afraid they will call me a liar. What was number five? I'm afraid that they will. So it started with fear and it also ended with fear. Five things and number one and number five are both fear. But they're different. The first fear was a fear of what? Being called a liar. Which means it was fear of being humiliated. It was fear of being publicly insulted. It was fear of being falsely accused. It was fear of being degraded, embarrassed. You understand that? And when somebody's being degraded or embarrassed, that doesn't physically hurt. You don't bleed because somebody called you a liar. No bones break when somebody calls you a liar. You're not physically in any pain because somebody called you a liar. liar. But in number five, what was his fear? They're, They're going to kill me. Isn't that physical pain? Yeah. yeah. yeah? To him... Being humiliated is a much bigger fear than being killed. Because you would think that he should say number five as number one. After all, when he ran away from Egypt, he was afraid that they were going to what? They were going to kill him. So you would think his first problem of being told to go back is, Ya Allah, I, how can I go back? I'm terrified they're going to kill me. And by the way, if number five happens, if he does get killed, then the other four are no longer a problem. It's already over. Nothing to worry about no more. But he puts that as number five. This is Allah's way of telling us something very powerful. Human beings are not like other animals. If you insult a cat or a cockroach, you ugly, useless insect, <laughs> you filthy creature, it is not affected at all. You can yell at a mouse all you want. It's not having a bad day because of the way you treated it. The only way you can harm an animal is by physically harming an animal. Some, emo some animals can have emotional connection. We're not talking about that. But for the most part, you can yell at a pigeon all you want. It's still going to do what it does. You know? It's going to mess up your car no matter what you do. Right? <laughs> But human beings, you go to work and somebody insults you at work. Some manager accuses you of stealing something or somebody accuses you of cheating or somebody else accuses you of lying or somebody else accuses you of being, you're doing something you haven't done and you feel pain anyway. And it's so powerful that it can be more devastating than physical pain. You know, the, the most important example of that in the Quran is Maryam. 
when she had her baby, Isa, she was going to go back with the baby, back to her Muslim community, back to the masjid. But everybody there knew that she's not married. So they were going to ask her, where did this baby come from? And this thought that she has to answer that question was so devastating to her that in the Qur'an, Allah tells us her words. He says, يَا لَيْتَنِي مِتُّ قَبْلَ هَذَا If only I could be dead before this happens. The fear of being humiliated is so powerful, it's even scarier than being killed. I, if you had to pick between the two, Maryam picked which one? Death. Musa, if he had to pick which one is one, number one, which one is first and which one is last, what did he, be humiliation. And you know what? Alhamdulillah, Muslims understand that because we're people of the Qur'an and we've had the Qur'an for 1400 plus years. Therefore, we never humiliate anyone, just like we don't kill anybody. We understand that these two things are really serious to Allah. Therefore, we never make fun of anyone. We never insult anyone. We never accuse anyone. We never troll anyone. We never make ugly comments about anyone on social media. We don't text anyone about anything like that. We never say mean words. Alhamdulillah. Allah has given us Islam. Therefore, everybody, the kuffar have that problem. But we, ha, ah, never. Because you know, we have Quran and stuff. I, I just gaslighted you. But anyway. But the point is, you understand how serious this is, yeah? To be humiliated. And this is important because Allah is teaching us that even when you're a prophet, even when you're speaking directly to Allah, and Allah is telling you to do something, then even though you fear Allah, when you're talking directly to Him, the fear of being humiliated doesn't go away. The fear of people's words doesn't go away. People's words are serious business. That's not, that's not a small thing. It can even terrify a prophet. And he can tell Allah about it. He can say, Allah, I'm scared. They're going to call me a liar. And it's, a, it's a pretty remarkable thing that Allah Azza wa mentions that because that is a fear many people live with. And because of that fear, they don't stand up to the wrongdoing people. You see, Musa had to stand up to the wrongdoing people, right? And his first fear was, if I stand up to them, they're going to start humiliating me. That's terrifying. That's why I'm going to stay in a corner and let them do what they do because it's too scary. Their words are too scary. What was the second thing after, you know, I'm afraid they're going to call me a liar? Hmm? Chest is get tight. Good. My chest is going to get tight. My, my chest. One at a time. One at a time. My chest. I'm happy you got it. My chest is going to get tight. What did I say the chest going to get tight means? It means you get panic attacks. Some of you, mashallah, are very well educated, or you have good jobs, you're confident in your work, you know what you're doing. You're professionals, you're managers, you're engineers, you're doctors, you're, you're, you're lawyers, you're mechanics, you're accountants, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Right, you do whatever you do, and people in your work know that you know what you're talking about. You're, you're versed in your field, you're articulate, you're able to express yourself. But when you are dealing with someone who can humiliate you, then even though you're so capable of speaking, and expressing yourself, there are some people who can just say the wrong, wrong kind of words, and all of a sudden your entire ability to speak disappears. Because your chest becomes what? Your chest gets tight, and you're no longer the person you are. Sometimes the wrongdoing people are very close to you. Sometimes wrongdoing people, like in the Prophet's lives, the worst wrongdoing people were usually family. Uh, the, the Pharaoh is actually the adopting father of Musa, so he's kind of family, right? Ibrahim salam, had to deal with his dad. The Prophet salam, had to deal with his uncles. So a lot, in a lot of stories in the Qur'an, the wrongdoing people are who? Family. They're family. Don't look at your family right now, hold on. <laughs> and it's really hard sometimes to go and confront family and say, hey, that was wrong. That wasn't okay. Because what they will say to you can be so devastating that you don't know how to respond. Like you need to talk to your uncle about how he mistreats your aunt. And you need to go and say, uncle, you need to stop pushing auntie down the stairs. It's not okay. <laughs> I, I think that needs to stop now. It's enough. Um, next time that happens, I'm going to call the police. And your uncle looks at you and says, you're going to talk to me like that? Huh? This is why I applied for your green card? <laughs> <laughs> and they'll, they'll start talking to you and then you, you know what's going to happen to you? your chest is going to start becoming what? Tight. tight you won't know what to say and when you say uh, 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 and they'll say what? exactly that's what I thought 
And then two hours later, when your neurons return back to normal function, you'll say to yourself, I had the best answer. I should have said this. <laughs> but it's not at the time, because at the time, your chest became tight and your tongue didn't move. So Musa is right. Sometimes you can have the right answer. You know what you were going to say, but when you're confronted with that situation, it just disappears. Your brain starts melting out. You have, you have a total meltdown. and you, You're no longer as articulate as you once were. And that's why he says, I'm not capable of handling that kind of pressure, that kind of anxiety, that kind of stress. I know someone who's better at that. Who's who? That's why it's number four. Just give it to Harun instead. I can't do it. And he, this is important because Musa doesn't believe that he's capable of what Allah wants him to do. Because he, he recognizes that he's weak in these things. And so he's like, somebody else needs to do this. I can't. And many of you find yourself in that position. You think of yourself as, I, I can't do that. Somebody else needs to do that because I can't. I know myself. I can't handle it. And he literally tells Allah, Ya Allah, I can't handle this. Give it to Harun. Some interpret this to say, I can't do it alone. Give it to Harun also. Give it to Harun. That's also an interpretation. I'm actually more compelled of the argument that he just said, you know, give it to Harun. And not just in addition to me, he mentioned all of his weaknesses and then said, give it to Harun. As if to say, look, here's why I can't. And here's why he's better. He should do it. I shouldn't do it. By the way, who is Harun to him? His mm. What's his brother? How many people here have siblings, brothers or sisters? You're Muslim, I don't have to ask. Uh, so, many of you have arguments with your siblings, fights with your siblings. You have, pro you know, sometimes kids come up to me, Salam alaikum. You see your parents force you to say salam to me? You guys do that all the time? So you have these awkward kids that are holding on to their parents. Brother Naman, she watches all your videos. She wants to say salam. She goes, no I don't! No I don't! Don't make me do it! Because <laughs> they're... It's such a dramatic, and I'm supposed to act normal? You're, you're like traumatizing your child for life. Because usually they see me inside an iPad or inside a phone, and apparently I crawled out of there. And I, like they're freaking out because <laughs> you're real? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then they want me to shake their hand. And like they watch all your videos. But sometimes, you know, I break the ice with kids and I start talking to them. And I say, So, you got brothers and sisters? He goes, Yeah. You fight with them? Yeah. What do you fight about? She takes my stuff. And then the other one here said, no, that's my stuff. You take my, no, you take my, and they start fight. <laughs> right there. <laughs> the thing is, when you, siblings, brothers and sisters, or sisters and sisters, brothers and brothers, we fight. It's life. It's been happening since Adam alayhi salam. The first brother and sister, one killed the other. What brother and mother, one killed the other. Yeah. Yusuf salam's brothers did what they did to him. Actually, in the story of Musa and Harun, at one point, Musa was so mad at Harun, he grabbed him by the beard. He grabbed him by the head and his beard in a headlock. And he said, could you please let me go? That's literally in the Quran. Okay, could you, could you let go of my head and my beard, please? Because Musa salam was really strong. And his brother wasn't as big, so he had him on lock. Now, don't do that at home and say, this is in the Quran, I got to do this. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, some of these clips are going to get misused so bad. Anyway, so the point is, siblings have rivalry, yes? So when sometimes you invite, you know, some of you girls, you invite one of your friends over to your house, and these girls look at one of your sisters and say, Wow, your older sister, she's so pretty. Oh, the way it burns you. <laughs> she's not. You don't understand. That's like eight inches of makeup. Let me show you what she really looks like. I recorded it. <laughs> and then you take a clip of like Jurassic Park when the, when the dinosaur first came out of the egg. That's my sister. That's what she really looks like. Because <laughs> you can't acknowledge something good about your sibling. It hurts. When somebody compliments them and says, wow, they're so smart. No, you don't know how stupid they are. Why can't you see the truth? <laughs> <laughs> you know But Musa alayhi salam is in front of Allah Allah is giving him a job And he says what? Who can do this better? My brother If any of you got a job like that, an honor It's an honor to be chosen, right? One of you got that job, you would have gone back and said Guess who got the job? 
Oh, you thought you speak better, right? Hmm. Here's the stick. <laughs> he says, give it to Harun. Now, when he says that, there's one last fifth item I didn't talk about yet. What's that? I'm scared they're going to kill me. I'm scared they're going to kill me. Don't believers know that life and death belongs to Allah? Don't we know that nobody will die unless Allah wants them to? And I'm pretty sure Musa knows that too, yes? He's still scared of being killed. But it's interesting he put that as number five because he knows it's actually not death that he fears. He fears that he's going to fail the mission Allah has given him. If he's dead, he failed. And he doesn't want to fail Allah's expectations. So he put that at number five. All of these fears, but I started by saying, when a prophet is told by Allah to do something, what does a prophet respond with? We hear and we? Obey. obey. That doesn't sound like obey to me. That sounds like, yeah, Allah, uh, I, I'd love to obey, but I can't. And here are five reasons. Because I'm scared. Because my chest will get tight. Because my tongue won't move. Because Harun's better at this. And I'll, they'll kill me. That doesn't sound like yes. That actually sounds like no. You understand that? Which is pretty shocking. And at this point, you would think, there, again, I have to remind you, because in Muslim culture, sometimes we become more Islamic than Islam. Again. So people say, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you to do something, you must do it. Or as they say in Arabic, do it. Okay? <laughs> you just got to do it. That's it. There's no option. You have to surrender because Islam means submission. You have to submit. Oh yeah? Have you heard of Musa? Because Allah told him to go and he explained to Allah why he can't. He gave a whole explanation. A whole essay answer. Instead of just saying, I hear and I obey. What does that teach us? Allah is far more understanding that you're struggling with something than people are. People will tell you to submit or surrender immediately. And if you don't surrender immediately, then you, Allah doesn't like you. Allah doesn't love you. Because you didn't surrender immediately. But Allah is telling you, talk to me. Not talk to people, talk to who? Talk to Allah. Tell Allah, Ya Allah, I want to obey you. But I'm scared. This is what I'm scared of. These are my weaknesses. Maybe I get panic attacks. Maybe my tongue doesn't move. Maybe I don't think I'm good enough, somebody else is. These are the things in my way that keep me from obeying you. Ya Allah, help me with these things. I'm not telling you these things because I'm justifying my behavior. Musa is not saying, I'm not going to go. He's telling you, Ya Allah, I need your help with these things. You know? This is why in the Fatiha, we don't just say, Iyaka na'budu. We don't just say, Iyaka na'budu and go to the next ayah. What do we say? Iyaka na'budu wa? Iyaka nasta'in. We will worship you, fine. But we can't do it without your help. Sometimes worshiping you gets hard. Sometimes obeying you gets difficult. Who are we going to ask for help if it gets difficult? We have to turn to you and ask. So he turns to Allah and asks for help. And before we break for the Isha prayer, I have to tell you Allah's response. And you're going to repeat it in Arabic after me. Allah says to him, Kalla. Say the Arabic word. Kalla. Good. One more time. Kalla. Kalla means not at all. Kalla means what? Not at all. Not at all. What's the Arabic word for not at all? Kalla. MashaAllah. You guys are officially Arab now. If somebody sees you outside and assumes that you're Arab and starts dropping a bunch of Arabic words on you, you could just say what? Kalla. Kalla and walk away. The complete conversation. Okay? Kalla means not at all. Musa gave this entire speech and Allah responds with Kalla. Ya Allah, I'm afraid that they are going to call me a liar. Allah says, not at all. You're not going to be afraid, you'll see. Ya Allah, my chest is going to become tight when they call me names. Allah says, Kalla, no, not at all. Your chest will be fine. And he says, Ya Allah, after my chest becomes tight, what's going to happen? My tongue won't move, Ya Allah. Allah says, no, not at all. Your tongue's going to move just fine. Ya Allah, I'm not good enough for this. Give this job to who? Harun. No, not at all. You still got the job. I know who I picked. Like, it's not like he comes to Allah all this time and he stands before Allah and Allah gives him a job and he says, Ya Allah, I have a recommendation. Harun is like really good. And Allah says, oh, okay, I'll consider that. Allah already knows. <laughs> He says, no, you still got the job. Oh, ya Allah, I'm afraid they're going to what? 
What's number five? They're going to kill me. Allah says, no, not at all. They're not going to kill you. One word, kalla, and it's all what? It's done. This is not the same as no problem when people say it. Like there, there's, a, there's a restaurant here. I won't name the restaurant, but it's a Somali restaurant. It's really good food. And they have a menu. On their menu, there's eight items. I swear by Allah, it doesn't matter what you order. They'll give you the same thing. <laughs> I have tried. And she's, the lady is so sweet. You go to her. I say, I want number four. And I want number three. She goes, no problem. No problem. No problem. And she's not going to give you the same thing. <laughs> so this is not the same no problem. You know? Like, um, um, you know, there's some places, there's one other restaurant I went to here. I don't know. This only happens in Dallas restaurants. I don't know why. And in the Dallas restaurant, I said, hey, can I have, can I have uh, um, what do you call, uh, lamb? You know? And they said, yeah, no problem. And they brought chicken. <laughs> and they, she wants chicken, like, karai. And I was like, this is, this is lamb karai? And she goes, yeah, lamb karai? <laughs> and I'm eating it. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure it's chicken. She goes, lamb. <laughs> and I started questioning my definition of lamb and chicken because she was so convincing. She was just a lamb. And she made me feel bad about believing that it was chicken. And then I held it up and I said, I was scared. I was like, I, I don't want a more embarrassment, but chicken? She goes, yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, Allah tells Musa what one word? Uh, then he says this. Check it out. He says, Fadhaba, both of you go. No, not at all. Both of you go. Who's both of you? Harun and Musa. Okay, okay. So Musa wanted Harun to go instead. And Allah says, No, 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 you're still on the job, but who am I going to give the job to additionally? Harun alayhi salam. Uh, how, you know, one of my desires in heaven is to actually watch the actual footage of what happened. Because one of the first things I want to know is Harun's reaction when he got the news that he's going to Egypt to face the Pharaoh because Musa asked for it. So when he meets Musa, he says, thanks a lot, bro. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> but anyway, he says both of you go. Now, the, the, the amazing thing, for, for those of you who are familiar with the story, the amazing thing is, Later on, Musa is going to debate with the Pharaoh. Yeah? And what's amazing is, Harun never spoke. Harun never spoke. The whole time, Harun didn't speak. He was there, but he didn't speak. And what was the whole reason Musa wanted him along? He's a better what? That leaves you scratching your head. Wait, he's supposed to be a better speaker. How come he don't ever what? He don't ever speak. The only time he uses his head is when he's being grabbed. Right? <laughs> so... How, the only time he speaks is, please let go of my head. That's all you hear from him. You don't hear much from him at all in the Qur'an. So what is it that made it important? Because Allah could have told him, listen, you're going to do all the talking, I already know this. I kind of know the future already, so you, could, you don't need him. Allah sent him anyway. So the point is, if Harun wasn't going to speak, why is he there? Because sometimes when you have to face a bully, when you have to face a scary situation, even though you fear Allah and you know Allah is with you, sometimes you need a human being next to you. You need a support next to you. You need a Harun next to you. You need someone who's there, even if they do nothing. Just the fact that they're there is enough for you. Okay, I got this. And the moment you're starting to breathe heavy, they can just grab your hand a little bit and say, easy, breathe, you got this, you got this. You know, uh, in sports, for example, in boxing or whatever, you don't just have the boxer. When the bell rings, who's in the corner? Your, your coach, your team. They're there and they're telling you and they're just encouraging you. They're not letting you... Because the, the battle isn't just a battle of the physical or the battle of... It's a battle of the mind. And somebody has to be there to keep your mind on track. Sometimes they don't even have to say anything. Just the fact that you feel you're not alone is enough. So everybody needs... A Harun in their life. If someone as brave as Musa needs a Harun in their life, and I'm not saying the person's name has to be Harun, because some Haruns are like Firaun, not like Musa. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't have to be your sibling. 
It doesn't have to be. It could be a friend. It could be a spouse. It could be a parent. It could be a best friend. It could be, we don't know who that's, that could be in your life that's there, but that's one of the biggest blessings you can have in your life, that when you believed that you couldn't even do something, because Musa didn't believe he was good enough. But what, Allah will give you someone in your life that's next to you, and you'll be able to do things that Allah knows you can do, that someone who believes in you knows who you can do it, even though you didn't think you could do it. You understand? So that, that, that's a powerful gift in Allah's, you know, the risk Allah has written for us, the provision He's written for us, is the right person in our lives. So He said, both of you go. Both of you go. Just moral support. Ushdud bihi azri. You know, later you find in this dialogue, I mentioned this to you last time, he, he described Harun as, give me Harun because he will support my back. He will support my back. You know, if somebody's pushing me, I'll fall back, right? And if someone's behind me, keeping me from falling, that's my back support. You know how we say in English, I got your back, bro. I got your back means when somebody's going to attack me, I'm not just going to fall, somebody's going to be there to catch me. Somebody's going to be there, you know? So he asked, Allah gave him Harun. Now, again, I keep telling you, some people are more Islamic than Islam, right? First thing some people say is, if you fear Allah, you should fear no one else or nothing else. Was that true? No, no you can fear Allah and you can still have fear of other things. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Then you, you found, if Allah tells you to do something, do it right away. There's no, there's no compromise or there's no steps. Was that true? No, sometimes you have to talk to Allah and work through things you're, that are holding you back. And the third thing is, when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't need anyone else. Mm, actually, you kind of do. You kind of do need other people. You know, because you have to be like Ibrahim alayhi salam, who needs no one else. Uh, well, technically Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa whenever he would go to battle, he, need somebody, he needed somebody next to him for moral support, so he would ever, always take one of his wives with him. She's not going to fight no battle. But she's his support. He needs it. Just like he needs armor for the battlefield, he needs that. The mental, the, the emotional support. Right next to him. You know? So there are sometimes people we need next to us. And that's okay. You don't have to say, I have Allah, I don't need anyone. That's not Quran. That's just not how the Quran is. You know? And so even Musa recognized that he needs someone. Allah acknowledged that he needs him. Allah didn't tell him, you have me, why you need Musa, why you need Harun? You know, you have me, I should be enough. He didn't say that. He said, both of you go. And as I leave you, I'll take a couple extra minutes. Uh, uh, as I leave you, I'll tell you this. Both of you go with bi'ayatina. Both of you go with our miracles. Both of you go with what? Our miracles. Can you guys call out one at a time, maybe show of hands. What were some of the miracles of Musa? Because Allah says, I won't just send you, I'll send you with our miracles. This evening is called miracles, right? So, why? What are these miracles? Yeah. Young man, yeah? Splitting the water, very good. Anything else, Aishi? A staff could turn into a snake, very good. Hand, hand turned white. Yeah, there's lots of miracles, right? Listen to this carefully now. This is, this is important. This is why I call tonight miracles. The water turning, the water parting. Is that a miracle for the eyes or the ears? If you saw it, you'd be amazed, yes? But if your, a friend next to you had, was blind or had blindfolds on, and the water started parting, and you were like, whoa! And they're like, what? What? It's not amazing for them. It's amazing for you because you what? You saw it. Or if a stick turned into a snake, is that for the eyes or the ears? The eyes. If somebody just heard it from next door, what happened? Oh my God, you had to see it. It was amazing. Didn't sound amazing. It sounded like you people were crying. Because uh, these miracles were not miracles for the ears. They were miracles for eyes. Yes, is that clear to everybody? Listen carefully now. This is where we're ending today, for this session. He says, go with our miracles, both of you. Inna ma'akum mustami'un. We shall be listening carefully along with you. Go with our miracles and we shall be what? Not watching, but what? Listening. Listening. To Allah, the miracles, the real miracles, because there's miracles level one and there's miracles level two. The primary miracle, 
The greater miracle given to Musa was not what was to be seen, but actually what was to be heard. What was to be heard? We shall be listening with you. There's something miraculous about the words he's going to say. What's going to happen next? We think that the most amazing part of the story is a stick turning into a snake, or water parting, or a hand turning white, or the nine signs. I'll talk to you about the nine signs later on tonight. But actually, no. The most incredible part of this story is actually words. Words that are about to happen. Allah says those words are so powerful. Go with them. He doesn't say we shall be watching. He said we shall be what? Listening carefully. And when Allah says Allah will be listening in carefully, that actually means that he's calling on all of his slaves, all of us, listen carefully to what's about to be said because there's some pretty miraculous stuff in there. That's some pretty heavy stuff inside it. And so inshallah, when we come back from the break, we're going to see how that conversation ensues and what these miracles actually are. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.